Since humans have existed, we've sought for better materials. And the materials available to society have defined the very substance of civilization. Think about it. Primitive man relied on tools made of natural materials like wood and stone. And some of these date back almost three million years ago. But then with a flash of innovation, everything changes in the third millennium BC because the first metal was crafted and discovered. All of a sudden, new tools and technologies were available that had never existed before. And these were continuously improved with the arrival of better materials like iron and later steel. It was less than a century ago that the first transistor was made, which led to the Silicon Age. And now, electronics and computers are completely ubiquitous. Today, we have plastics, ceramics, semiconductors, composites of nearly infinite variety. That aluminum metal that you think you're familiar with, there's 530 different types of aluminum. There's 22,000 grades of steel. With this enormous variety in established engineering materials, one would be forgiven for assuming that for every problem imaginable, a material solution already existed. But this is far from the truth. In 2008, the National Academy of Engineering identified the so-called 14 grand challenges in engineering for the 21st century. These are things like providing access to clean water or making solar energy economical. In other words, things that we will have to solve in order to continue progressing as a species. And well over half of them will require the discovery and deployment of new advanced materials. So, the question I hope you're asking yourself is, where do all these new materials come from in the first place? Do you ever wonder, what was the first person thinking who thought to themselves, I wonder what'll happen if I take this green rock and put it in this incredibly hot fire? What do you think went through their mind as they dug through the ashes for the first time and uncovered copper metal? It might surprise you to learn just how many of the materials that we use on a daily basis were discovered totally by accident. And I'm not talking about a few random alloys that you've never heard of before. These are critical engineering materials. Things like stainless steel. Things like the rubber tires on your car or your bike that brought you here today. Super glue, superconductors, Play-Doh, LSD. My gosh, the list goes on. Shatters distant windshields, the little blue pill for crying out loud. <laughs> All of these things were happy little accidents discovered totally by chance. So the question is, what exactly does it look like for a material to be discovered accidentally? Let me give you an example. Consider artificial sweeteners like saccharin, you know, the chemicals that put the zero in your Coke Zero while still letting it taste sweet enough to turn away a hummingbird. The year was 1878. There was a scientist named Constantine Fallberg who's busy at work in his lab working on coal tar derivatives, which are not artificial sweeteners. He spills some chemicals on his hands, and then he decides to go to lunch without washing his hands. You know, because 1878, I guess. <laughs> he takes a bite of his dinner roll. It's way too sweet, and so get this. He goes back to the lab, and he starts licking things. He's licking beakers and test tubes and dishes and pipettes, trying to find the chemical responsible for that flavor. And as crazy as that sounds, 90 years later, the artificial sweetener aspartame was discovered the exact same way. James Schlatter splatters some chemicals on his hands and then decides to lick his fingers to unstick two stuck pages of a book. And voila, another materials discovery brought to you by totally unsafe lab practices. <laughs> I feel like I need to offer like a little disclaimer for any students that might see this from my lab. We definitely don't do this in my laboratory at the University of Utah. <laughs> now, even when materials haven't been discovered serendipitously, the process of new materials discovery is way too slow and complicated. Maybe you've heard that Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. He didn't actually invent it. But he was the first person to make it long-lasting and economical. So let's go back to the year 1878. A 31-year-old Thomas Edison is frantically at work. He's trying to develop 
a light bulb filament material that will stay lit for more than a few hours. During a two-year tour de force, he tests over 6,000 different plant fibers before eventually stumbling across a carbonized bamboo that stays lit for 1,200 hours. You know what's remarkable? Today, this exact same Edisonian trial and error approach, albeit loosely guided by some basic design principles, it remains the de facto approach for discovering new materials. Is nobody else bugged by that? <laughs> Think about it. When it comes to materials, there is a universe of possibilities. And yet at best, we're relying on Edisonian trial and error coupled with high throughput testing. And at worst, at worst, we're relying on sheer dumb luck, like the scientists who lick the unwashed chemicals from their hands. <laughs> Clearly, this isn't going to cut it. It's not going to cut it because we face enormous engineering challenges. Clean energy, carbon sequestration, drug discovery. What about managing the nitrogen cycle as we try and feed almost 8 billion members of the human family with modern fertilizers? This is why, in 2011, the White House released the Materials Genome Initiative, which had the admittedly ambitious goal of developing and deploying new materials twice as fast at a fraction of the cost. Now, initially, scientists figured that the Materials Genome Initiative simply meant that we're going to do more simulated experiments and fewer physical ones, since these are both faster and cheaper. And this gets us part of the way there, but it faces some fundamental limitations. For one thing, calculating new materials properties is really slow, even with the world's fastest supercomputers running around the clock. Calculating a single property for a single compound, that can take a week or more. Moreover, some things we simply don't know how to calculate. This is where machine learning can help us. By rapidly predicting properties, instead of slowly calculating them, or even worse, measuring them outright. Maybe you've heard of machine learning before. It's in the headlines constantly. If you haven't, let me explain the basic principle with an example. Let's assume that I'm trying to predict the height of all the people in this room. Now, if I can't measure your height directly, then it might be fair to ask, well, what can I measure about you? Could you tell me your age? How about your weight? Could you tell me your shoe size or your gender? Machine learning relies on data and then uses patterns and inference to perform a task, like predicting height, and it does it without being given explicit instructions on how to do this. In other words, it doesn't matter if my model doesn't know the mechanistic reason why heavier people tend to be taller people. I can just use that correlation. The more information I have about all of you and the more examples that I have to train from, the better and better my model will get. Now, let's take a step back and compare this approach with the traditional approach for materials discovery, which is to play it safe. We play it safe by looking at already known, high-performing families of materials and then we make slight changes to the composition or microstructure. But what this leads to is local optimization and incremental discovery. On the other hand, to pick a composition randomly out of a hat has very, very low odds of success, trust me. It's too risky for researchers. Machine learning has the potential to unshackle us from the burden of doing things the way that it's always been done. Extremely fast, and accurate predictions of materials properties made possible by artificial intelligence means that we can screen for new materials across vast compositional and microstructural space. Moreover, it can release us from reliance on chance when it comes to materials discovery because for the first time, it gives us a tool that allows us to design for rational serendipity and calculated luck. So now that I've described the promise and the premise of materials informatics, the only real question you should have is whether or not this actually works. Let me explain with an example from my own research. Super hard materials are critical. We use them for drilling and grinding and machining. Heck, if you're Elon Musk, you'd like to use them to build a futuristic freeway system underneath Los Angeles. The hardest material we know of is diamond, but even synthetic, Non-gemstone versions of diamond are way too expensive. We would love to find alternative super hard materials. The only catch? 
discovering new super hard materials is, it, it isn't super easy. And it's not as if we've never tried before. Since the Stone Age, mankind has been after harder materials. So, enter materials informatics. With funding from the National Science Foundation, my collaborators and I set out to try and screen for new super hard materials using machine learning. Now, we knew that any material that would be super hard needed to be not only incompressible, but also rigid. And the good news is that there existed extremely slow but fairly accurate calculations of these properties for some 5,000 compounds. The bad news? The bad news is that there are literally hundreds of thousands of other compounds out there. We know they can be made, but we have no idea what their properties are. We decided to use machine learning models and train it on the small data set we did have. We figured once we had a model that worked, we could predict all the other compounds that we were curious about. Once we'd actually built and validated our model, we were now free to begin making predictions for any chemistry we desired. So we predicted the incompressibility and rigidity for over 100,000 compounds, including many that you could have never calculated anyways because they featured rare earth elements or disordered structures. Best of all, we performed these predictions in about 30 seconds on a simple laptop. In this plot, you see the predicted incompressibility versus the predicted rigidity for all 100,000 plus compounds. And one would expect to find new super hard materials in the top right quadrant. When we examined those materials, sure enough, we noticed two compounds that hadn't been extensively investigated, so we synthesized them, we measured their hardness, and I am thrilled today to tell you that we had just discovered not one, but two new super hard materials. What's incredible about this story is that we went from knowing almost nothing about super hard materials, and in a little over six months, we had already synthesized, identified, and measured two new compounds among the hardest ever discovered. Compare that with the previous approach for materials discovery. And this is exactly what the Materials Genome Initiative is all about. Materials dramatically faster at a fraction of the cost. And it's not like we were successful because we were better chemists either. We cheated. We cheated because we knew where to look. Whereas a traditional researcher faced enormous possibilities and had a one-at-a-time approach for looking for them. In today's talk, I've shown you one successful application of materials informatics. But similar success stories are cropping up from other applications across a wide variety of other domains. The first aluminum alloy that could be 3D printed, that was thanks to materials informatics. Functional designer chemicals, record-breaking dye-sensitized solar cell materials, all thanks to materials informatics. So here's my invitation to all of you. Think for a minute about a material that you would have previously considered was totally impossible. As a kid, I saw the movie Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, and it features this then fictitious material, transparent aluminum, a metal that was impossibly transparent. Today, we have materials like indium tin oxide that remains transparent even though it conducts electricity as if it were metal, or aluminum oxynitride, which is rigid and strong like a metal, but completely transparent to ultraviolet, visible, and infrared light. I want you to use your imagination now. Consider what else might be possible. Clothing that never wears out? A dinner glass as shatter-resistant as steel? What about completely biodegradable electronics? How about metamaterials that bend light around them, rendering them invisible? Materials that completely absorb sound, or my personal favorite, and the holy grail of materials discovery, a superconductor that functions at room temperature. The incredible speed at which we can now screen for new materials with targeted properties using machine learning, it represents a quantum leap compared to previous approaches. It is every bit as transformative for humanity as the discovery of bronze, iron, steel, or silicon that came before. Humans have entered the information age, but we've only just begun to see the incredible things that materials informatics can do to unlock rational serendipity for materials discovery. Thank you so much.